Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Maggie Meggs, and I'm the director of the Forest Dwelling Program, Spirituality for Our Wisdom Years. I'm so glad you're able to join with us for this delightful taste of the spiritual gifts available to us in the autumn and winter of life. I designed this series of short videos to introduce you to the themes we work with in the program. Of course, I'm only able to briefly touch on the rich offerings of our two-year journey, but I think it's enough to whet your appetite for more, whether through joining us in the Forest Dwelling Program or perhaps joining with friends or family who are also on this journey of harvesting the fruits of your time on earth and coming to know the God of love in the ordinariness of your life. In a moment, I will read a prayer from the Irish writer, John O'Donohue, because it poetically describes spiritual fruits of the journey through the challenges of aging. But first I want to introduce our administrative staff, which includes myself and Emmett Gonzalez, who will be the program manager when we start our next cohort in January, 2025. My role is formally titled director, but only because they wouldn't let me use the title of tender of the forest. That's how I see myself. We move together through this journey of aging, and I am here to help as needed. I love talking with people, so please do reach out to me if you have any questions or comments other than the administrative, administrative and technical ones, which Emmett will expertly and joyfully answer. I am a retired clinical psychologist and current spiritual director so my passion is creating an environment in which our incredible core faculty, Father Ron Rollheiser, Reverend Mary Earl, and Dr. Marilyn McIntyre can lead people on this journey of transformation. You won't be hearing from them in this video series, but we periodically have webinars which feature them, and you can read their bios on our website and check out their amazing books as well. They are incredibly moving speakers with different styles, which weave together beautifully. And now I would like to bless you as we begin our video journey together by reading this beautiful prayer from John O'Donohue. A blessing for old age. May the light of your soul mind you. May all your worry and anxiousness about becoming old be transfigured. May you be given a wisdom with the eye of your soul to see this beautiful time of harvesting. May you have the commitment to harvest your life, to heal what has hurt you, to allow it to come closer to you, and become one with you. May you have great dignity. May you have a sense of how free you are. And above all, may you be given the wonderful gift of meeting the eternal light and beauty that is within you. May you be blessed, and may you find a wonderful love in yourself, for yourself. Amen. I read this prayer often because it touches on the reality of being human with our tendency to worry about becoming older. We worry about losing our independence. Our wounds feel closer and closer to the bone. We recoil at thoughts of the seeming indignities and losses that come with an aging body and mind. And we lose some of the denial that cushions us when we are younger, stronger, and busier. This blessing also reminds us that we have a soul to guide us through this time of aging and diminishment. You may want to check out O'Donohue's many books if you haven't already. 
Connie Zweig, a Jungian analyst and author, wrote another excellent book entitled The Inner Work of Age, Shifting from Role to Soul, which is a powerful resource. We do not live in a culture that values old age, nor one that teaches us how to find the spiritual gifts that are actually more accessible at this stage of life. We're often asked why Father Ron Rollheiser and his team started the Forest Dwelling Program. Maybe 12 or 13 years ago, he was asked to speak at an event on aging at Our Lady of the Lake University here in San Antonio. In his words, he was coming at it pretty generically, mentioning that in the Western world, we don't have a forest dwelling program, which is the Hindu tradition. That was the designated time for spiritual seekers who had finished their careers and raising their family. And they retired to the forest to be taught by spiritual elders generally in the stage of life from ages 50 to 75. Rollheiser notes that, in fact, we don't even have a word for this time of life. For example, we have a word between child and adult. It's a phase called adolescence. We don't have a word between full activity and the retirement home or assisted living. So he said, we need some kind of program. And Cecilia von Bertrab, a spiritual elder and one of the co-founders of Forest Dwelling, came up to him after his talk and said, that's exactly what we need. In reality, we're living healthier and longer, so it's essential to ask ourselves, what are these final years for? and to live this purpose in the context of a mature spirituality, which Rollheiser, an eminent theologian, says that the Christian tradition has not yet developed. And that is what we are offering people in the Forest Dwelling Program. I wanted to highlight the four phases or themes that we use in the forest dwelling program because it will give you a sense of the major elements of the spiritual journey of aging. We will only touch on the entering phase in this video series and the three subsequent series, which we will be releasing later, will touch on the others. It's a kind of a funny thing to say, but we've never been old before. It's new for all of us. So the first thing on the spiritual path of aging is to squarely look at how you view old people and the aging process. Since I've been in the forest over these last six years, I pay attention to how people react to the word old. Many people will deny the biological fact of aging by saying something like, I'm not old or I don't feel old even though they are well into the last part of their life. The implication is that there is something wrong or not so good about being old. Of course, the body is definitely not as user-friendly as it once was, and we can fight against that, or we can learn how to tenderly care for it. In fact, the word old actually has a Latin root meaning nourish, more important than ever is nourishing our aging body by looking at what we eat and drink, our activity levels and need for rest, and to engage in spiritual practices that are nourishing now. All of these are likely different than what worked when we were younger. Try and catch yourself when you're ignoring the messages that your aging body is giving you and consider making some changes. This is a gift. The same is true for your spiritual practices, maybe how you pray. It's something, if something is no longer nourishing your soul, give yourself permission to try something new. 
A spiritual director can be invaluable in this regard. If you don't have one, you can email Emmett and he will send you information on how to find one. Do you remember when you first recognized that someone else saw you as old and how you reacted to it? It's an interesting question to ask yourself and others. For me, I was carrying a duffel bag in the airport on our way to go on an RV trip in Alaska, so I couldn't use the hard-sided luggage with wheels on it. I was lugging the bag and doing okay, but this young man came up and asked if I needed help. I was surprised and suddenly realized that a corner had been turned. Interestingly, I thanked him and said, no, 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 I can do it. It's no surprise that we often deny or ignore the signs of aging because our culture does not value aging at all. And without even realizing it, we often also hold negative stereotypes of elders, a subject that has been researched and well-documented. In the book I previously mentioned, Connie Zweig calls it our inner ageist. You may want to pause the video now and reflect on the following questions. Keeping a journal while you are going through these videos may be quite enlightening. What positive models of aging influenced you as you grew up? What negative models of aging? What is your reaction to the word old? What word do you prefer to use? For instance, senior citizen, elder, elderly, grown, and why? What are some of the pejorative terms that you have heard or used describing others who are old? Humor can be a two-edged sword that evokes laughter, but that also illuminates a bit of the prejudice we hold about getting older. The author Parker Palmer says that aging is a journey best done in the company of others, and I have found that to be true. I think it's helpful to find other spiritual seekers who are interested in sharing this journey. I have often remarked to those who have been in the Forest Dwelling Program that I can't imagine facing some of the challenges of life as an aging person without the community I have built, and they always agree. Not everyone is interested in this journey of conscious aging, and there is absolutely no judgment in this, but it sure helps to have a trusted and supportive community to share it with. This is maybe something you can begin to build as you find people who will watch and discuss these videos with you. Knowing the importance of community, in the program, we place people in elder circles led by elder spiritual directors. They journey together in groups of six to 10 people for the two years of the program and often beyond by sharing their lives within the context of some of the suffering and the joys and freedoms involved in aging, trust builds, which allows people to go deeper. Now, why is this important? Because as John O'Donohue touches on in his blessing, aging is a time to heal our wounds. Maybe for the first time, we have the capacity to recognize the sacredness of those wounds and to meet them with newfound compassion and tenderness. The mystic and teacher James Finley says that compassion is the love that recognizes and identifies 
with the preciousness of all that is lost and broken in ourselves and to others. I want to say that again. Compassion is the love that recognizes and identifies with the preciousness of all that is lost and broken in ourselves and others. Allowing our terrible wounds to become sacred wounds can open us to the shared humanity of our broken yet beloved world. Part of the process of aging is discovering that there is no pain that you have suffered which has not been felt by another. I would like to suggest that if there is a deep wound in you that has not yet healed, that seeking a trained therapist or joining a self-help group may be an important step for you. I also want to briefly note that we purposely made this a program centered in spirituality, not religious beliefs and doctrine. You already know what spoke to you and held you on the spiritual path earlier in life. This stage of life is a time when we can become more ecumenical in our orientation, learning how to know and experience God in the widest and most loving way without having to argue about some of the beliefs that so often divide and exclude people. Kathleen Dowling Singh, a spiritual writer and teacher who was going to be a core faculty member and died suddenly a few months before the first cohort, has written two very important books, which I highly recommend, The Grace in Aging and The Grace in Dying. She says that if we have any desire to ripen into spiritual maturity, into the abiding experience of the sacred, of all that lies beyond this small self. Now is the time. This is a partial list of spiritual movements that lead us into the soul work of aging. They represent a dance between our egos, our customary way of experiencing and engaging with the world, and the soul's call to live from a deeper place. In my experience, this happens gradually upon, excuse me, along the spiritual path, but is clearly helped by reading books, grappling with the diminishments we encounter, listening to elder spiritual teachers, reflecting and spending time in contemplation and silence. And of course, the Holy Spirit is working in us all along answering prayers, and inviting us into the love of God in new ways. Activity, doing, solving problems, being in control through knowing information and the right answers, these are strongly held cultural values. We fear the loss of independence and often worry that we will become a burden to others. And whether we like it or not, the physical, Cognitive and relational changes of aging are not under our control. They are part of the natural order which God created and called very good. So the invitation is to befriend and embrace the diminishments of aging in a way that is realistic, knowing that God is present in each painful moment and in this way, you will be able to discover the hidden spiritual gifts in the process. Fighting makes it very difficult to hear the soft whisperings of the spirit. One of our core faculty, Reverend Mary Earl, has written a number of books which reflect the deep wisdom gained through her experience with chronic illness and her immersion in Celtic Christianity. Please take the time to read her beautiful work and tune into her webinars. 
it will give you a new appreciation of how marvelously made we are, as the Christian scriptures say. She's given me the opportunity to truly experience what embodied spirit means. In a recent talk, Reverend Mary shared the wisdom of Father Kelly Nemec, who once told her, God is offering spiritual direction at every moment through every encounter. We just need to wake up and pay attention. This is now your invitation to, for many of us, time in nature helps us to listen and hear those whisperings. Perhaps you might like to pause the recording now and reflect upon which of these movements seems most challenging to you at this point in your journey and which are beckoning you as well. In her book, The Inner Work of Age, Connie Zweig writes that the purpose of aging then is not merely to slow down, it is to slow downward. It is to shift our attention and our energies from the outer world to the inner, from role to soul. It is to connect the moment to eternity, the fleeting to the lasting. Aging initiates us into renewal in late life. For those of you who have noticed that you're experiencing changes in meaning and purpose as you entered this stage of life, it's a common occurrence. As I entered my 50s, though I will always love being a therapist, I noticed that my drive to work with people sh struggling with the psychological and life skills of adulthood was subtly shifting to a more spiritual orientation in dealing with those issues. I was being called to go deeper and I signed up for Richard Rohr's living school and then trained to be a spiritual director. I also started meditating daily. In some ways, it was a subtle shift, but an important one. You may notice that your drive and passion shifts and your focus on achievement, even though it was in a role that served others, begins to wane or change at this stage of life. What now was the question for me as I gave up my psychologist practice? It took a few years and I faithfully waited for the next invitation, what Rollheiser calls a gray-haired pregnancy. I was very surprised when it was a call to enter into the forest dwelling program, first as an elder circle leader and then as the director. I also chose this quote from Connie Zweig because it helps to realize that there is mystery, the unknown that is beckoning us to go inward, not just to slow down, but to slow downward with a new focus beyond the roles we are most familiar with. It involves a process of shifting our focus, attention, and even our identity to greater depths. This is the shift, the movement from our earlier way of being busy with raising children or building careers to a rich and mysterious and eternal aspect of who we are. Thomas Merton calls this moving into a closer relationship with the true self. Paradoxically, by becoming more aware of the fleeting nature of our physical life, we can finally relax enough to discover the hidden Christ within in new ways. Slowing down physically and energetically can move us to a greater enjoyment of what is here 
along with that which is beyond. You've probably heard the old saying, don't forget to stop and smell the roses. And now is the time to do that. In a similar vein, Father Rollheiser emphasizes the significance of gravity in the aging process. He says, gravity doesn't just affect your body, pulling things downward, so too for the soul. It's pulled downward, though it means something very different. The soul doesn't age, it matures. You can stay young in soul long after the body betrays you. Indeed, we're meant to always be young in spirit. Souls carry life differently than do bodies because bodies are built to eventually die. Inside of every living body, the life principle has an exit strategy. It has no such strategy inside a soul only a strategy to deepen, grow richer and more textured. Aging forces us, mostly against our will, to listen to our soul more deeply and honestly. Aging takes us to a deeper place, whether we want to go or not. Father Ron has long admired and expanded on Henry Nouwen's work over the years. When envisioning a mature spirituality and, de and developing the Force Dwelling Program, he borrowed the concept of being fruitful as a hallmark of consciously harvesting the spiritual gifts of aging. Nouwen's book, You Are the Beloved, contains daily meditations which develop this idea of being loved by God, and the fruits that result from knowing that you are truly beloved. The more you know in the deepest part of your wounded self that God loves you unconditionally, the more you will be able to love others in a similar manner. And the more you do that, the more fruit you will bear in this last part of life extending well beyond your death. Nowen says, we are called to give our lives to others so you and I can bear fruit and all brokenness and all dying and all suffering is there to allow you to enter into solidarity with the whole human family and to give yourselves to others so that your life can bear fruit. God asks you not to have a successful life, but to have a fruitful life. Notice how different that is from the orientation of success that is appropriate and needed for the first half of life. So what is the difference between achievement and fruitfulness? A dictionary definition of achievement is a thing done successfully, typically by effort, courage, or skill. Fruits, of course, are the results of what has been done. For me, one of the differences between achievement and fruitfulness is that achievement is work that is recognized by others as something important about you. It's what we can call resume building. The type of fruitfulness that Nowen is talking about comes from a different place. Perhaps we can say that it is more from the heart than from our direct effort. More from the spirit of what we do, an intangible that is representative of the simplicity of being, being kind, being open, being able to receive. At this stage, it's allowing people to care for you when you have no power, no control, 
no skill set. It's learning that letting those you love see you in such a state and tend to you is a gift that will leave a rich mark on the legacy you leave behind. There is a tenderness generated that is often absent when you are, as they say, large and in charge. One of the important challenges to face as we age is this reality that we are no longer the ones who will give the care and realize that we must now let those who care for us feel the joy that comes with giving. How we receive that care will leave either a wholesome fruit or a bitter one. Let's use the example of two people who are no longer able to drive or take care of themselves. One of them is cranky because they don't know how to receive and critical of how they're being taken care of. The other smiles kindly and shows their appreciation. Imagine the, un imagine the unpleasant fruit of the first example. The second one is likely to create a spirit of love, of satisfaction and goodwill and the person who is caring for you as well as for yourself. Most of us are comfortable in the role of being the giver and unconsciously believe that it is better than being the one receiving. I think this can be particularly hard for women. Now is the time to begin challenging that orientation. In reality, one can never give without receiving, nor receive without giving. It's always a mutual relationship, but that's easy to miss. Becoming a grateful receiver will add new meaning to humility. So you may want to reflect on this question. What might you need to work on which will encourage the fruits of love when you are no longer able to be the achiever, the giver? Work on your pride, perhaps, or your need to be needed, or the wounds that tend to make you bitter and angry about life. Doing this inner work can help you to leave behind a spiritual legacy of fruitfulness, not just a long list of your successes. This fruit comes from the tender branches, not from the trunk of your achievements. Father Ron expands on Henry Nouwen's work Rollheiser says that the central spiritual question is not how much time remains, but rather how can we prepare now so that our dying will be a new way for us to send our spirit and God's spirit to those whom we have loved and who have loved us. This is the soul work that will allow us to give in a special way to those we love, and which in some ways is far more difficult than all the hard work that we did in the achieving years. It has a lot to do with those move movements we referred to earlier. Many of us were taught by our parents and or our churches that the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are values to live by. And we were more or less successful in doing so. 
In truth, most of us will benefit from revisiting these as essential values to live from in our later years. Reverend Barbara Brown Taylor, who was a core faculty member in the first cohort of Forest Dwelling, calls these vitalities, which are not dependent upon the diminishments of our aging bodies and minds. It may be fruitful to spend some time thinking about how you apply those gifts to yourself, because this will influence how you respond to challenges such as lack of mobility, difficulty remembering, and becoming physically weaker. How loving are you to yourself? How joyful do you allow yourself to be? How patient and kind and generous are you with yourself? Now is the time when you can regroup, rethink, and commit to a more tender way of living with yourself and with others. Jesus was tender as he interacted with those who were powerless, devalued, hurt. Now is the time to begin praying for those gifts of the Spirit for yourself and practicing the graces of kindness, compassion, and generosity with yourself and others. This will help you prepare for, more, for when you are more and more dependent on the kindness and care and generosity of others. The good news is that this in turn will create a fruitful legacy. Our weakness and old age call people to surround and support us. It's another reminder that our powerlessness and vulnerability can actually bless others. This may be a more difficult concept for men to grapple with, but it's a gift you give by allowing your children to care for you rather than being ashamed or apologizing for needing them. A simple thing perhaps is to call and ask for help moving something heavy rather than trying to do it with an aging back. It's another example of healthy humility and can forge a new relationship with your loved ones if you're able to ask for help in a way that acknowledges how grateful you are for them. Can you think of someone in your family whose death left you feeling blessed by them? In my family, my mother and my father died in very different ways, one leaving a legacy that was much easier than the other. I use these stories to illustrate the difference, standing not in judgment, but in compassion. My father died suddenly of complications from his alcoholism in his late 60s, and my mother died of COPD in her late 80s, having been sober for over 40 years. Both of them loved us, but my dad was raised in an orphanage and never developed the capacity to deal with his vulnerable feelings, making it almost impossible to recover from the death of my six-year-old brother. Dad was unable to cope with the profound grief a parent feels when their child dies. He also did not know how to relate well to his adult children. Dad needed to be needed and continued to tell all seven of us what we were doing wrong instead of supporting our decisions and encouraging us. These were some of the wounds that he could not heal, and his own broken heart contributed to, contributed to a legacy 
that was lacking in the spirit of love, which we knew he had for us, but which had been barricaded deep inside his pain and shame. When he died, we had nothing much to celebrate in his passing, though we still loved and missed him. The good news is that it's been over 30 years since he died, and through the grace of God, the hurt has faded, and now the love flows freely in his memory. A much different story, my mother got sober through her attendance at AA meetings beginning in 1976. This allowed her to make room in her heart to heal her own grief at my brother's death through attending a self-help group for parents and then going back to school to get her master's degree in social work to become a certified bereavement counselor. Her terrible wound had been transformed into a sacred wound as she helped so many parents cope with their grief. By the time she died, each of the remaining seven children had time to care for her as she slowly diminished. We helped her when she couldn't do much for herself. Listen to the same stories again and again, and we're happy to repay her for those long years when she cared for us. Although mom seldom told us out loud that she loved us when we were younger, since that was how she was raised, she learned to do so in her later years. Mom became generous with her praise, thanking us for taking good care of her during those last years when she needed us. It was an honor to care for her, even when it was a bit of a challenge. She didn't like to use her walker and would often fall. My father had way more money, a more impressive resume, but he was so wounded and guarded that he couldn't allow us to come close in the ways I'm sure he would have liked. My father could not be tender with his broken heart. My mother became more and more tender, the less she could do for herself. Tell the people you love how much you admire them and love them, even if you have to do it by writing it in a card. As you do the inner work of cultivating the fruits of the spirit, especially towards yourself, so too will you be able to show them to your loved ones. Weak you may be in the body, full you will be in the spirit. And that is what will leave a fruitful legacy. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. Jeremiah 17, verse 7 and 8. When I did the Ignatian spiritual exercises a few years ago, I found this scripture particularly relevant to me at this age. I hope it will inspire you in some way too, because there are definitely challenges, periods of dryness, and even doubt. It is also the chance to go deeper into the waters of love. You may want to pause this video, reflect upon these questions, and journal for a moment before you move on to the next slide. And these are a couple more questions that you may want to sit with later or pause the video now and journal. What has touched you most deeply in this talk today and why? What particular 
diminishments do you fear the most as you age? And how could they possibly bear fruit as they occur? I'm going to finish this session with a beautiful poem by Mary Oliver. So I invite you to sit back and enjoy. When I am among the trees, especially the willows and the honey locust, equally the beech, the oaks, and the pines, they give off such hints of gladness. I would almost say that they save me and daily. I am so distant from the hope of myself in which I have goodness and discernment and never hurry through the world, but walk slowly and bow often. Around me, the trees stir in their leaves and call out, stay a while. The light flows from their branches and they call again. It's simple, they say. And you too have come into the world to do this, to go easy, to be filled with light and to shine. Thank you so much. I hope this talk has given you a place to start on your own spiritual journey of aging. Our next video in this series will be released next week. We'll see you then.